Nowadays, fluorocarbon is used for main lines, hook links, leaders, just about everything. But I've never really incorporated it seriously into my angling. Sure, I've dabbled with it, but I've never really just kind of used it on a consistent basis. One of the reasons is I've never bought into the hype that I can catch more carp just because I'm using fluorocarbon. I just don't buy it. Let's face it, fluorocarbon is an expensive material. 100% fluorocarbon mainline costs around seven times that of regular mono. Coated fluorocarbon mainlines are much cheaper, but they're still a cost differential. It's about one and a half times more expensive. So what are we actually getting for our money? Fluorocarbon has a refractive index close to that of water. That's a fancy way of saying that it's virtually invisible underwater. Now, all anglers of all disciplines are obsessed with hiding the end tackle from the target species, and carp anglers are no different. So the idea of fishing with invisible lines is very attractive. The trouble is, as soon as we put materials like fluorocarbon into a lake or a river, they're going to attract any sediment really quickly. And that sediment will stick to the line and it basically makes it become visible quite quickly, in fact. So although we might start off fishing with something that is you know, virtually invisible underwater, within half an hour, an hour or so, it stands out quite clearly. So if your justification for using fluorocarbon is the fact that it's invisible, I don't buy it. It's not going to be invisible for long enough to make the difference that I need it to do in my fishing. Fluorocarbon has a specific gravity of 1.7. Again, that's a scientific way of saying that it's going to sink really quickly because it's 1.7 times heavier than water. In carp fishing, heavier is always generally thought of as being better, especially for bottom fishing. So if the line will sink by itself, then that's a good thing. I love simple rigs and I only ever add something to a rig when it's absolutely necessary. So the idea of using fluorocarbon, uh, the fact that it is heavy and will sink by itself without the addition of any other components it is great. You know, I like that about it. But with the development of a reusable tungsten sinker, I can make regular mono just as heavy, if not heavier, than fluorocarbon and I can move it between rig to rig. I don't throw them away, I recycle them all. So I can get a cheap mono to do exactly the same as a more expensive fluorocarbon. So on the weight issue, I can't justify using fluoro. Another big claim for fluoro is increased knot strength and increased abrasion resistance. But as there are no actual recognized standards in fishing for manufacturers to compare anything to, they, we don't actually know what any of it means. Everyone's going to say that their line has got good knock strength and good abrasion resistance, otherwise they wouldn't sell any. Pop it on there like that. And we've got a little test rig. Yeah, it passes that with ease. And you'd expect that, of course, because that weight is, you know, it's nowhere near the rated uh, strength of that material. I certainly had materials fail below half their strength, which is a bit shocking. That is a very heavy weight to pick up. You do not want to drop this on your toes. Yeah, that's good stuff, that is. I don't care what it says on the tin until I've tested it. Once I've tested it and I know it's right, and it means that the knot I've chosen is right, my technique is right, then it's good enough. So this is the Cam H2 rigmarole, again 310 blood knot. I can feel this material stiffer actually. Tighten that knot down. Oh, close. That's rated at 25 pound and yeah, it's gone at 17 pound. I mean, that's just one knot, so you know. I was doing this scientifically, then I do kind of multiple tests and stuff. This is just a kind of quick demonstration of, uh, of how to do it and what sort of results you can expect. 
if you can get five kilo knot strength on a on a hook link for a carp fishing situation i mean that is absolutely loads but because uh, we got cats to 135 so you know they pull back a bit and we have to take things to the absolute extreme yeah that's a pass as well so this is the 0.50 30 pound heavy duty snag leader and that's a good solid pass uh, that's what I expected from that material because that's the one I use the most of. It you know, is plenty, plenty strong enough for the job even when things get quite extreme. So what this means is that 0.50 mono compares very, very favourably with fluoro. Even if the fluoro was slightly thinner, one was 0.47, one was 0.48. But, you know, they, they, they all pretty much passed the test. The rigmarole was a bit off, but I wouldn't too worry too much about that. It's still an immensely strong material. But, you know for general carp fishing but uh, yeah so there's absolutely no reason why you shouldn't be able to achieve really strong knots with bog standard mono you don't have to spend the extra money on fluoro just based on uh, you know a concern over knot strength it really shouldn't be an issue when you're talking about these type of materials actually when you compare materials like for like fluoro versus the same thickness of mono in my own kind of you know just in the garage benchmark tests i don't get this uh, performance differential so i've just grabbed a few spools from my tackle box and i've just set up a really quick benchmark abrasion test i'm using the same part of the rock be between these materials 33 the materials do vary in, di in diameter from 0.45 up to 0.60. The 0.60 uh, compares very favorably to the fluoro link. Uh, yeah, the fluoro link is 0.45, but the snag leader at 0.60 is far less money than the fluoro carbon material. So every time I would choose the cheap mono, even if you have to go a bit thicker in diameter. I mean, for most of my fishing, I use the 0.50 snag leader anyway. So uh, unless it gets really, really extreme when I'm faced with zebra mussels and uh, you know severe hazards like that. So if you do the test yourself, you, you're going to get different numbers for me because, you know, your, your rock will be different. There are all sorts of parameters. I'm trying to keep the pressure between each test the same, but do the test yourself and prove to yourself whether the materials that you want to use are up to the job that you need them to be. So while it all might sound very good, you know, good knot strength and good abrasion resistance, if you actually compare it against you know, some good quality mono, I'm not sure it really stacks up these claims. The one thing I would say is that, you know, do the testing yourself, go into the garage, see for yourself just how good it is or not. These three benefits of fluoro are actually the reasons why I don't use it. Now this wouldn't be too bad if the issues stop there, but for me, it gets worse. If you use fluorocarbon as a hook link material, diameter for diameter you will find it to be stiffer than mono now sometimes you want something really stiff so you know it, sure it, it's an option but given the fact that there are loads of you know cheap monos available out there if i want a stiff hook link i'll just choose a thick mono if i want something really supple i'll choose a thinner mono yeah 12 pound Mono is 0.35 diameter, and I've caught 30s, 40s, 50s on on that material, no problem. Obviously, I wouldn't use it in a in a weedy or snaggy uh, environment. It's only suitable for open water fishing, but you know you can do this with the regular mono. At the same time, if I want something you know really stiff and robust, I can use a leader material. I can use 0.50. I can use 0.60. It it's you know relatively stiff it's a lot, lot stiffer than 0.35 um, it's incredibly robust so if i'm coming up against rocks or zebra mussels then uh, you know that's the sort of material i need so this is some fluoro link in 20 pound that's 0.45 diameter and you can see that it's really quite springy stuff i couldn't use that unless i'd uh, mounted it on a rig board or or i'd steamed it 
If we compare that to some heavy duty snag leader, that's 30 pound and 0 0.50, then this is much suppler. And I can use that very easily. I'll just stick it on a rig board, no need to steam or mess around like that. And that is lovely stuff to use, but it's a bit thicker. If I wanted something as stiff as fluoro, then I'd go up to 40 pound 0 0.60 snag leader Yes, it's much thicker, but I'm really not bothered about that in the slightest. But that gives me the same kind of stiffness as the fluoro. So this is really difficult to capture on video, but basically I'm feeling how much force is being applied from the line to the tip of my finger. And that gives me a judgment as to how stiff the material is. So all of these fluoros are about the kind of same specification, 20 pound 0.5, 20 pound 0.47, and this is the 25 pound uh, 0.48. So they're all much of a muchness really. And in terms of stiffness, they're all very, very close to one another. It doesn't matter which one of these I pick up, they're all gonna be about the same sort of stiffness. But if I want something as stiff as fluorocarbon, but um, at a much lower cost, then I'd use, you wanna use something fairly heavy. So uh, 40 pound 0.60, this is what this one's rated at. Um, Often I'm not, I don't want anything as stiff as the fluoro because I just don't like how that super stiff material reacts. So uh, I just use the 30 pound 0.50 and that makes a fantastic hook link. The only fishing situation where I'd ever even consider using fluorocarbon is if I was fishing uh, an absolute gin clear shallow lake, maybe in the winter, at short range where distance doesn't become an issue but I'm still not convinced that it would make a difference versus my regular monofilament choices. If you watched any of my other videos you'll know that I'm a massive fan of simple rigs especially simple mono rigs. The Mono Hair, the Mono D, they're absolute timeless classics they, they've always worked and they've always will work and I often get questions on these rigs uh, Matt, do they work with fluorocarbon? Well, the answer is, yeah, of course they do. But my response is always, why? Why bother? Why do you need fluorocarbon? It's not going to catch you more carp, so it's just adding cost. I know some of you out there are going to be horrified by this because you absolutely love your fluoro and have got an awful lot of confidence in it. And yeah, you know, confidence is great. I understand that. I'm not trying to undermine that confidence. But I just don't think that the the fluoro is making making the difference. In fact, I go as far as to say in that because of the cost of fluoro, you're less likely to want to change the rig after a carp or after a cast. And if you're not changing the rigs regularly, then you're not changing your hooks regularly unless you're using a multi-rig. And if you're not changing hooks, then you're absolutely costing yourself chances. For me, it's much better to spend your money on the most important things, good hooks, lots of good hooks. Rig materials should be cheap and I spend as little as I possibly can on my rig materials and I always have. Fluorocarbon mainlines have a memory and if you want to use them consistently then you're going to have to get in the habit of walking them out, stretching them out in order to keep them to be fishing friendly. They also cast much worse than regular mono. If you're limited in the range that you can fish, you are costing yourself chances, especially if you start to fish larger waters. One option, of course, is that you go thinner, but the thinner you go, the more risk you're taking. And why take the risk? There's no point in hooking a fish that you can't land. So if you want to use fluoro, you'll be limited with the range at which you can fish. Unless, of course, you use a lighter grade of fluoro. Lower breaking strain will be thinner. Thinner lines cast further. But thinner lines uh, are more fragile. There is more risk of them letting you down. Coated fluorocarbon lines do cast a lot better than 100% fluorocarbon lines for sure. But by taking the amount of fluorocarbon out, you lose this big differential in specific gravity. 
So are they really going to sink any better than some good quality mono? Well, for me, I don't see it. If you use a 100% fluorocarbon mainline on a weedy water, you're going to have some real challenges ahead of you. The fluorocarbon is going to sink into that weed and when you get a take you'll be playing the weed even more so than you would because that fluorocarbon is going to sink into that weed and it's going to be a real challenge to bank what you hook. If you try and use 100% fluorocarbon lines on a rocky venue you're also going to come in for some challenges as well because that line is going to sink and flow and sit over any gravel bars or rocks or plateaus that are between you and the spot that you're fishing. I tried it here at Bow and it, it was a bit of a disaster to be honest. Um, every time I'd get a fish I'd be cutting off metres of line because I'd, I'd walk out my lines and I'd check my lines uh, and because uh, I could feel when I lifted into the fish that the line was really kind of it took a lot of lifting off the bottom and my presentation was great and I caught some lovely fish but this business of continually having to walk out the lines and check the lines and cutting off the damage it was a it was a real pain actually and uh, by the end of by the end of 12 months of fishing with fluorocarbon mainline uh, I had to bin it I'd literally run out of line so for me it was an expensive mistake in the situation that I was fishing. So these are the materials that I'm going to be using to tie this rig. This is a mono hair rig so we're going to be using some 20 pound bullet mono. Now if you're using 15 pound main line then just use some of your main line. Then we're going to need a run rig rubber, hair stops, I'm just going to use a little two ounce lead obviously you can use bigger leads but Two ounce will fish this nicely over a range of substrates. We need a shod style hook. It could be beak point, could be straight point, but it must be an outturned eye hook. Then we need a size eight ring swivel, some rig tubing. I'm using some little 15 mil baits, could be 18 mil baits, could be 20 mil baits, it really doesn't matter. And then this is really important. I haven't got the retail pack of these, unfortunately, but you're going to need some little hook beads. OK, to start, we're just going to get some of the mono. And the first thing I'm going to do is just check it between my fingers, make sure that there are no kinks or nicks. It also helps straighten it out. And then we're going to measure off 40 centimetres of material. Then we're going to tie a nice small neat overhand knot. This is the knot which is going to go inside the bait so whatever size bait you're using you need a loop small enough to go inside that bait. So in order to make a small loop what I do, just open that up again, if I hold the knot there and I pull down like that, that'll make the knot small. If I were to immediately pull from the loop, it would make the knot bigger. So if I just pull that down like that, when I'm happy with the size of the loop, then we can slip the rig puller in there, wet that down, and just tighten him up so he's nice and small and neat. We can have the tag end off nice and close. Then we get a 15mm bait. Very carefully pierce him through the middle. I always just spin it round like that, make sure I'm going through the middle before I commit to going all the way through the needle. And if you put your finger there, just very gently press with the baiting needle, it stops it bursting through the other side and splitting the bait. Hook on our loop. Very carefully pull that in until the loop emerges out the other side. Then we're going to take our hair stop. I like these little extender stops actually because it means I can bury the stop inside the bait. So we get round to there like that and I pull on the material and you see that 
See that hair stop disappearing inside the bait? Well, the carp have got a very sensitive organ on the roof of their mouths. It's called the palatal organ. And that's what helps them sort food from non-food item. So that's food, that's not food. So I don't want a bit of plastic touching that palatal organ if I can help it. So if I just pull it nice and neatly into the bait, then that's what I'm looking to achieve. Okay, now we need to grab a hook. Before I grab a new hook, I just run my finger that direction and I'm searching for a burr. But I can't feel one and then just a little run underneath there. Yeah, no burr, so that hook should be perfect. So then we need one of these little hook beads. You've got a blunt end and a tapered end. I'm going to insert the hook in the tiny, tiny hole in the blunt end. Just be, oh, that's gone nicely actually, that's already, you can see the point just poking out there. And once he's through, just very carefully pinch and slide it round. Now if you've never bought or used hook beads before, different hook beads will suit a different range size of hooks. So you've got hook beads that will suit size 1 to 6 and hook beads that will suit size 7 to 10. Just make sure you're using the right size hook bead for the right size range of hook. Now we're going to take the tag end and we're going to go, that's the back side of the eye, that's the front side of the eye. The front side is always near the point and we must thread from the back and exit the front like that. If we don't do that, this rig will not work. So there's a join in the eye and it's on this side of the hook. So the first wrap of the knotless knot must be on that side. If you whip that side first, there's a risk that that join can actually cut the mono. You can see the hook bead is positioned just opposite the point there. My nail's opposite the point there as well. And I'm just going to pull the bait up until it nestles just in between my thumb and my index finger there. And that point fixes the hair length, roughly the same length each time. And then we whip away from the joint in the eye. One, two, three, four, five, six seven turns I'm going to do here and once we get to that point there we've just got to maintain tension hold the knot and then we pass from the back out the front that's really really important that if you don't do that again it's not going to work once you get to that point just wrap the mono around a finger there. Leave your index finger and thumb free if you can. And then hold that there. Slide the hook bead up. And that does a number of things. This hook bead is stopping the mono relaxing. If that wasn't there, those wraps would open up and I'd lose control of the exit point of the hair, which is so critical. This is kicking out the hair from the shank, and this is really important. So that's how the finished rig should look. So let's have a look at how this performs on the palm test. He's in. He's in. He's in instantly. That stiff hair is forcing the hook to just turn and grab. A good way back as well, that's a good 30 mil back. He's in. Oh, bit of slippage that time, but he's still turned over pretty quick. He's in again. So that's how it should work. Now, if I take that hook bead out of the way, I don't know whether you can see this, but the knotless knot has just started to relax a bit. And if I wiggle that about any, it opens up a little bit more. If we have a look what happens on the palm test, it goes in like that. 
Oh, it did turn. Ow. Oh, there we go. Can you see it's sliding? Now, on the bottom of a carp's mouth, there's a really kind of fine membrane back here behind the lips. Now, I tried this rig many, many years ago, tied like this. And what I found was that if you have the hair exiting along the line of the shank, what happens is the hook will cut through that membrane and you'll be, it'll create a nasty tear in the bottom of the fish's mouth. And I hated to see that and I stopped using this rig. But the addition of that little hook bead cures this problem. I'll show you that again. It did catch there, but you see it just kind of nicks it. it. There we go. Just tends to skid. And that's not what you want. Whereas if I squeeze that hook bead into place, it just kicks that hair out. We're in. And you can see when I pull, the point pivots and it wants to dig in it wants to dig in at a really aggressive angle so it's not wanting to skate like that it's wanting to dig and grab and you'll get phenomenal hook holds so let's have a look how this simple little rig performs in a basic tank test I'm using the bottom bait and you'll notice that the bottom bait sinks very quickly to the bottom and then the hook sits on the bend. Momentarily, that hook hangs vertically, but it's going to fall one way or the other, left or right. And because of the stiffness of the mono, it's going to drive that loop to fall left or right. This solves the problem of hook link looping up. The ring swivel at the other end enables that loop to fall friction free one way or the other so there's no interference whatsoever. This keeps the mono hook link out of the way of the carp's senses. It makes it much harder for them to detect. This is going to get you more bites. This is going to catch you more carp. I've been fishing this rig an awful lot without putty. I just don't think there's a need to add putty. Now with a braided rig or a combi link type material, it's really important to add those little blobs of putty in order to get the whole thing to sink because you don't have the same mechanics as this simple mono rig. What you can see is because there's no supple sections or pivoting sections or swivels halfway along this rig, there's nothing to tangle. You've just got one simple piece of mono that's basically a very, very soft spring it just wants to be straight and fall into its natural position. If you're looking to simplify your fishing, to take away this, oh, what rig shall I use today? This is the most all round rig that I've ever come up with. It's absolutely, you can take it anywhere, catch anything. Small lakes, massive lakes, flowing water, caught some smashing fish on the river using this rig just because of its anti-tangle properties. Just before dawn this morning I had a right result. I had an absolute one tone on an open water spot that I've been fishing. A little five bait stringer, nothing complicated, that basic rig that I've showed you and I've caught an absolute banger. His name Pepe, it's the biggest common in the lake and it's a new lake record weight at 45 pounds, eight ounces. Let's get him out and have a look. Let's have a chat about hook link materials. When I first started fishing with this rig, I turned to one of my old favorites and that was big game. I like the 25 pound version, the 0.48 for fishing maximum range because it's got that bit of extra stiffness to it. 
For fish in medium range, I found that I could drop down to the 20 pound big game, which is uh, nowadays it's 0.38 diameter, and that worked great too. This year, I'm testing the Nash Bullet. This is the 20 pound version in 0.40, and I gotta say, I really am liking this stuff. If the main line that you're using is between 0.35 and 0.40, I'm sure it's gonna do a really good job for you with this rig. One of the massive bonuses of being able to use mono for a hook link is it's kind of free. This is the remains after I spooled up three of my reels a couple of weeks ago. There's 200 meters left on that. I need 40 centimeters per rig. You, well, you do the maths. It's an awful lot of hook links. If you're a big fluorocarbon fan, there's no reason at all why you can't use fluoro with this rig. Personally, I just don't think fluoro is necessary for the sort of fishing that I do. So I'd rather save the money and just use mono. Let's talk about hooks. Got to use outturned eye hooks, shod style hooks with this. If you're using an intern eye hook, it's going to close down that gape. It's going to end up looking like that. And that is not what you want the little hook bead detail. It might seem like a tiny thing, but it makes a massive difference. When I first started experimenting with this rig, I tried my normal trick of whipping a couple of turns underneath the hair, and it just didn't quite work. The, the knotless knot slipped and it opened up and it moved, and I lost the exit point of the, uh, of the hair and it just wasn't quite right. Little hook bead, works a treat, slip it on, put it into position, reusable, what's not to like. So the absolute essentials of why this rig works so well, the stiffness of the 0.40 mono, the outturned eye hook, the little hook bead there, which acts as a kicker and stops the hair rotating around and moving. You can play with the length of the hair, you know, if you like it tight to the bait, fish it tight. If you like a longer hair, fish it long. This is the sort of length that I've been fishing it at and it works great. You can also turn this into a really killer effective pop-up rig, just with the addition of a split shot. Now, if I'm doing the pop-up version, I do have a much shorter hair because I want the pop-up to be closer to the shank of the hook. but really effective, really simple. In terms of PVA options, it works great with a simple stringer. You can put some baits in one of the funnel web systems and create a little sausage. You can make up little crumb sticks, been doing that quite a lot and that's fantastic. Just gives a nice little bit of flavor next to the hook. The only PVA option that this is not gonna work with is a solid PVA bag. Bit of a shame, but the mono's just too stiff to get folded into a bag. You might be able to get away with it if you want to fish a really, really kind of short hook link, uh, a fairly large bag, just kind of fold it in. I haven't tried that, but you know, if you want to have a go with that, do have a go. Let me know how you get on.